zoomed in. Hey, Jeff. Oh, I'm hey, reading Brent. over there. Nard. Nard, the National Association of Rudimental Drummers. No, Wolfman's got nards. Right. Look at this stuff, man. This stuff is no joke. This is what I do for fun. It is all the same note again. Da 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 da. It's it's percussion. Da 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 da. Yeah, it just sounds like that. Da da during this part of the song. Now go da 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 da. When I was in, uh, hey YouTube, hi. When I was in marching band. We used to have a saying that if you could say it, you could play it. And so it'd be a lot of like, no, it's bum, bigga bum, bum, bigga bum, bigga bum, not bum, bigga digga, digga digga, dum dum. Come on. Oh, shoot. Okay, I got it. I got it. Ladies and gentlemen, we just learned that Jeff was a band geek. I was. Yep. Ah, that's not true. I was a drummer. Band it's geek. different. It's different. Jeff, any fun stories about band camp? None that are good for, actually, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> did you ever stick a drumstick up your? Oh, never mind. Sorry. Did did not did I did, no, <laughs> did not. We did uh, we did sleep with our drumsticks. That's the thing they had us do um, because to become one with them. They're just their your drumstick is an extension of you. So my drum instructor back in high school was I don't know if they use this word anymore, but he was a burnt out hippie, <laughs> and uh, which I'm led sure to that word in somebody today. Yeah, I don't mean it to be offensive. Yeah. It's just what we said back then. Yeah. Uh, dude was mostly mostly sober by that point, I think. Uh, he's a great drum teacher. He's an amazing drummer. But uh, definitely had some, say, more ethereal ways of describing the percussive arts. Jeff, I'm pretty sure you just picked out your own Halloween costume this year. <laughs> That's it. You should go as a, as a mostly out, sober. As a burnt out hippie drum teacher that should be your your deal you've got the beard and everything going man i do throw the tie nice let it on you'd be good yep done and done oh, put yeah. some drumsticks in the back have the drum key hanging off my belt what are we doing jeff we are here to talk about babylon 5 not all of this is not halloween we costumes are. man actually yeah so tell them about the show but we're doing something kind of cool at the beginning we, of this one that so I'm guys we're changing about. stuff up we're changing stuff up as babylon 5 for the first time continues to grow and Jeff drinks his fake beer over there. His water. Uh, it's so it's fake. Like it's it's just water. It literally is. <laughs> um, but it murders your thirst. But as the show grows, we are doing something who is. Jeff and I have noted something about our personalities. You guys out there have noted something about our personalities. Jeff tends to have a really good memory of the stuff that has happened like stupid details and you know what i think it is jeff i think it's because you take better notes than i do yeah, i don't know i don't know it. that it's that you you remember it as much as just you take really good notes am i wrong is it I, I you remember just remember if you just have that kind of memory a little bit of both oh, okay yeah. cool uh maybe you have that kind of memory because you take really good notes that might yeah it's that whole like oh i wrote it so now it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's there yeah, i understand that uh i have a tendency to make some okay pretty good predictions sometimes here and there um, and, uh, you guys out there are the ones who know exactly what's right, what's wrong and everything in between. So we are, we are revamping our intro as frankly, Jeff, I think this show takes, um, uh, and by the show, I mean, the podcast takes a decidedly more Babylon five turn than a star Trek turn. Yeah, I think we've been pretty clear, right? Moving to Delta Furies and other yeah. things. And I mean, let's just put it to bed, like this whole thing to bed. We never thought this was a Star Trek show. Never. We never were comparing it to Star Trek. Like we've said it we used the time. term. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's just, we used the term. That's it. But now like we're not even, we're rarely using the term yeah. anymore. It's, this is Babylon five. And so yeah. we're just leaning, leaning it's Babylon five, doing Babylon five messages in a Babylon five way is really yeah. where we are. And we're, we're leaning more into that. Um, but Jeff and I still are who we are and we are, we are approaching the show from this particular angle of being uh, Star Trek podcasters and looking at, at things through that lens as well. So anyway, uh, you guys are going to notice that as a change also. Um, well, I'm not going to tell you about the other change. Yeah. We're we'll just see gonna, if anybody catches it. It's, huh. it's kind of a Jeff and I, it, it's honestly probably the part we work on <laughs> the most, the most like out of everything. Yeah. And literally no one has ever commented on it ever. Not once, not once. And so 
we'll let you guys try to figure that out if you're there. Um, but Jeff, if, if you're good to go, I'm good to go. Let's hit that sweet music over there and get rolling. You are valued and you are needed. You will be emperor. I think you're about to go where everyone has gone before. The year is 2023. The name of the podcast, Babylon 5, for the first time. Welcome to Babylon 5 for the first time. Not a Star Trek podcast. My name is Jeff Aiken, and I am the one who was. And I'm Brent Allen, and I am the one who will be. And we are watching Babylon 5 for the first time for you, the one who is. Jeff and I are two veteran Star Trek podcasters searching for Star Trek-like messages that are being done in a uniquely Babylon 5 way. And while this is not a podcast about Star Trek, we are sure to pull in those references. Because, like, honestly, how, how could we not, given who we are and what we do? But to help us with that, we play the rule of three. That means we each get up to and no more than three references to Star Trek per episode. That's it. Three. One of those plays. No substitutions, exchanges, or refund. <laughs> hey, Brent. Hey, Jeff. We have a five star review. Oh, yes. This is from Apple Podcasts, and Beckers29 says. What's up, Beckers? Loving this. I've had a lot of fun with this, but sometimes it's odd to hear this show compared to DS9. Yes, yes, I know that's been a thing since 1994, but the similarities are few and far between. What confuses me more is why more folks aren't comparing B5 to Lord of the Rings. Yes! Yes! This is what we've been saying for like a month now, Jeff. Yep, exactly. Yes! Oh. Well, well, Brent. Yes, Jeff. We have another five-star review. Oh, yes. This one's also on Apple Podcast from iCourt. iCourt. What's going on, iCourt? It says, bringing B5 back. You asked for more reviews from female listeners, so here you go. When I first started this podcast, I was unsure how long I would last, as it seemed the hosts were so focused on how Babylon 5 was Star Trek instead of appreciating the series for what it was at the time, right? Groundbreaking storytelling with compelling characters and lines that I still quote to this day. As an OG TNG fan, I was hesitant back in the 90s to watch this, but so glad I did, as 30 years later, this is one of my favorite stories of all time. I was surprised that they understood B5 as soon as they did, and I'm enjoying the insight into the show from fresh eyes. I laugh when you get it wrong and yell when you get it right. I'm so excited for what is ahead of you and can't wait for your reactions to some of the best story twists and turns of all time. I highly recommend a rewatch when you finish and also reading JMS's biography. Looking forward to your future episodes, and I highly recommend this podcast to all B5 fans, new and old. Court, thank you so much for that review and getting us and understanding what's going on. Thank you so much, and welcome. Yeah, love to have you here. I, I felt so cool, and it's like, hey, you got the, you, you figured this out so quickly. Well, thank you for noticing. Yeah. We did. Yeah. Thank you for getting us. Like, that's. Yes. Yes. Actually, both of these reviews today, Jeff, like you guys get us, you really understand what we're going for and what we're all about here, uh, at Babylon five for the very first time. It's awesome. Thank you. Well, Jeff, you know, uh, along with that rule of three, you just mentioned a few moments ago, uh, there is another game we like to play. Now this game happens at the end of the episode where we try to guess what next week's episode is going to be about based on title alone. We haven't watched any trailers. We haven't uh, looked at thumbnails to get a clue or read any show descriptions. It's literally just the title of the episode, which sometimes gives the entire thing away and other times 
does not at all. Well, this is the spot of the show where we revisit last week what we said this week was going to be about. And so, Jeff, I'll put it to you. What did you say the summoning was going to be about and how close were you? I thought we were going to dive into like how Garibaldi was tortured and stuff like that. And that is uh, that's not what happened. I thought there'd be some drama around pulling the fleet together to head off to Zaha Doom. And that that part uh, that there was definitely some drama. Mm. What did you think? Well, it, based on the idea of the summoning, I thought that uh, uh, this was going to be Sheridan summoning the powers of the first ones to himself. You know, like, because Sheridan's got to be our big hero, right? And and this was, he was going to get powered up, or maybe he was going to be summoned to the ancient council of the first ones or so, something of that nature where he's he's receiving training or power or something from all of the first ones to become the guy who's got to uh, beat the shadows and all that sort of stuff. And yeah, I wasn't right at all. Like, I was off by a mile or two. It's still a, it's a great idea for it. I, I think it'd been a kick-ass episode to be honest with you yeah it'd be cool if there was like some council of ancient first ones right? or whatever right. yeah you know what i had in my cool. mind i think i told you this last week um you've seen troll hunters on oh yeah the animated show uh there is a there's a point where jim the new troll hunter gets pulled into like some weird ethereal realm that only he's allowed to go into where he meets the other troll hunters of the past and they kind of like put him through a training thing and like imbue him with power or whatever and, and send yeah. him on his way like uh, that was epic it's, that's kind of, that's in my head kind of what i was thinking or maybe like in mulan when the the ancestors like <laughs> you know something of that nature well jeff uh for those out there who haven't seen this episode in a while or maybe they haven't watched the episode they're just listening to us because they like us why don't you tell the folks what this episode was actually about well jakar is living the exact life that londo said that he would they've got him in a jester's hat they're humiliating and torturing him or i mean maybe having pain technicians apply their techniques to him or whatever whatever it is they're calling it these days but no matter what no matter how much pain no matter how much starvation they put on him jakar will not budge he will not scream. He will not beg. And this gets Cartagia so mad, he personally lays into Jakar, but he remains silent. Londo meets with him. He tells him that he must scream or Cartagia will kill him. Jakar says that betrays his very being as a Narn to scream, which Londo says, well, hey, if you're dead, will you be any more Narn? Londo sits back calm, quiet. He looks Jakar straight in the eyes and he says, Night of the fight. You might feel a slight sting. That's pride. With you. Well, pride. Pride only hurts. Never helps. You fight through that Because a year from now, when you kicking it on the Narn homeworld, you're going to say to yourself, Londo Malari was right well 39 excruciating lashes with an electro whip later and jacquard does it he screams also screaming are some of the league worlds they've had enough of the len aggravating the shadows if they just stay cool right they don't do anything maybe they'll buy another thousand years of safety from the shadows they organize a public protest and Delenn asks Lanier to keep an eye on things so she can be there to say her piece. Before this though, she tries to say her piece to the new Kosh, but Lita is still running interference for them. They've ordered her, Lita, to get rid of all of her furniture except for her mattress because, well, all that furniture is a distraction. But she's the only person on the station that new Kosh will talk to. They don't have any time for Delenn or anyone else. And their time with Lita is getting worse and worse. She complains that new Kosh hurts her and that she feels that like, like at least old Kosh kind of cared about her. She gets brave, tries to read their thoughts, but gets mind blasted up against a wall for trying. Our buddy Zach, he's up against a wall too. He got the info on that Montagna guy, including his flight path. 
Nobody knows where Jakar is or where he's been, and Zack's worried they're going to lose this dude if they wait too long to find him. And then Garibaldi would be lost forever. He leads a small wing out to intercept. They try to take out the ship's engines, but somehow that blows the whole ship up after it ejects a life pod. We see Garibaldi, wrapped up in saran wrap, in the life pod and some green light activating a program. What program, you ask? Well, I'm sure we'll get to that later. Zack gets him to med lab and Dr. Franklin gets to work bringing him back to health. As much as he tries, though, he can't remember a single thing. Ivanova remembers something, though, and that's that she has some inside info on where the first ones might be. She gets a white star to try recruiting some of them for the big fight. Delenn tells her to hurry, though, because her arbitrarily chosen deadline for attack is coming up soon, and we gotta do it because I made up this deadline, and so I gotta get everybody panicking about it. Come on! Come on! Hurry up! Quit wasting time, Ivanova! Well, she and Marcus fail in their quest to find new ones, but they do find something a little more valuable than that. The beginning of a beautiful friendship. Marcus shares that he still has his V card. Wait, no, come on, come on. Get your mind out of the gutter. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about virtue. <laughs> and yeah, the other, the other thing too. And they actually do find some first ones on their little journey, but they aren't new first ones. Nope, they're Vorlon. And there are thousands of them. The protest finally breaks out on the Zocalo. Adrazi and some other dude are making the case for a peaceful solution, warning that no one survives Zaha Doom. Delenn says they're acting from fear. Delenn says they're acting from fear, but they retort that she is acting from grief and sadness. Oof. Truth stings, doesn't it? As they're arguing, intentions are growing, an unidentified ship uses the station's docking codes to dock. We see two silhouetted figures inside. They step out of their ship, and moments later, Captain John Sheridan walks right up to the Drazi, who sheepishly apologizes and steps down. He then gives a speech that will be vying for the top spot in all of Babylon 5, as he says, Tell your governments that the only man to survive Zaha Doom sends this message. We can end this, not just for now, not just for the next thousand years, but forever! I stand before you as proof that it can be done. We can fight and we can win, but only if we do it together. Elated and seeing victory in their grasp, they meet in Sheridan's office where he tells the stories of the shadows in the Vorlon. Garibaldi, who's been looking pretty apprehensive about everything, asks who this new dude is and Sheridan and Drew... And Sheridan introduces Lorien. Garibaldi isn't too keen on this, but is cut off as Ivanova comes and tells them about the Vorlon fleet. Lita explains the shadows just destroyed a planet. An entire planet. Because it once had a shadow base on it. They killed four million people to do this. They're going to destroy the shadows once and for all along with anything and anyone that has been touched by them. It may not be a sword, but we have our three sides. It's the shadows versus the Vorlons versus everyone else. Brent, take us down your journey of your summoning. So this episode for me was a very even keeled episode. A lot happened in it, but like, I, I mean, I kind of feel like I should apologize for the Brent watches video this week. Cause a lot of it was really just me going, Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. And I'm not saying that I was bored. I was not bored through this episode at all. It held my intention the entire way through when Sheridan comes back there, uh, you know, and he's standing on that thing and he's, he's given his, his bill Pullman independence day speech or his Picard. Like, I mean, I feel like Sheridan's had a couple of these speeches. 
He has. You know what yeah. I mean? Like put put him in that 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 YouTube video that takes like all the motivational speeches and sticks them in one like continuous video. Like he's got to go in there. Um, but it was. I think I feel like at the end of the season, this episode is going to get lost in the um in the the ocean that is going to be the rest of the season. Does that make sense? Like like yeah. this this episode doesn't feel like it hangs its hat on any one thing. Like there was this little thing and then this little thing and then this little thing and then this little thing, but none of them were like huge and i know there's people what do you mean sharon and coming back is huge like i get it like that was an important moment but i don't feel like anything was like 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 major happened in this particular episode does that does that make sense at all what i'm saying it does but i don't necessarily agree like well i mean i do and i don't like you're right it's like okay we knew Sheridan was coming back. He had to come back, right? Yeah. We, yeah. We knew that was the thing. Was it huge and epic when he showed up? Yeah, that was awesome. Sure. Knew it was coming. But I almost think of this one as like the coming of shadows of this season. Okay. Where I think the coming of shadows was a great episode, but it did get overshadowed by overshadowed. Uh, see what I did there? Uh, but by other episodes in the second season. But that's what launched the Centauri Narn conflict. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the episode. Yeah. Well, I agree. Totally agree. It's going to get eclipsed. Yeah. But this is the one that introduces the Vorlons as adversary. Mm. Yeah. Does that does that make yep. sense? Yep. And that's as I know people are like going to comment. What do you mean this this is what happened in this episode? And that I yeah I oh uh, uh, eclipsed. That's a good word, Jeff. This episode's nice. going to get a, a, eclipsed. Um, overall, I liked it. It, it was a fine forty five minutes. You know what I mean? Fine, forty-five minutes. Um, I, it, some fun stuff happened. You know, uh, yeah. some stuff to talk about. But uh, Jeff, how about you overall? What What do you got? This was like we've had a, a long string of like great episodes from season three into here, except for that King Arthur one. Yeah, yeah. But basically, from that point forward, th these have all been great. Yeah, and this was the hardest moment for me to not hit play to watch the next episode was this time. Oh really? Because no, really be be because of the Garibaldi stuff. Oh yeah. There is clearly something going on with Garibaldi Yeah, and yeah, I mean, wherever he was, whatever was going on with him through the whole episode, right? He's just, he's always looking, looking around. He, he's the guy not buying into any of the hype. He's the guy asking questions, looking, I mean, he asked about Lorian, yeah. And I'm like, that's a really good question. <laughs> like, who's this old dude wearing like, you know, crown, like royal vestments that no one's talking about. And, Sh and Sheridan's whole answer is, well, I trust him. So you should too. Well, I trust like, him. So you should too. No, 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 no. no. I need more than yeah. that. You just came back from the dead. Like, yeah. I don't, I don't, I, I'm not a hundred percent sure I'm into you, Right. you know, being right. here, right. let alone that. So yeah. Like, and, and the way that the episode ended with him starting to go after Lorian, starting to go after Ivanova and Sheridan and other people, I was like, Oh my God, I got to say like all the other stuff was great. Yeah. It was amazing. I loved, I loved so much of what happened in this episode, but I was like, yeah, I'll catch that next week when we get ready to watch. I can't wait to see what happens with Garibaldi. Yeah, well, I mean, let's let's talk about them. So uh, it probably was honestly the most interesting thing to me out of this episode of trying to track. So last week had a whole episode called Whatever Happened to Mr. Garibaldi. We got his story for 140 seconds. Yeah. Like, that's it. So he gets, I, I just want to track this because I still am super confused about what's going on. He was told by Sheridan, "I, ha you need to do a favor for me. And he winds up going off by himself in a star fury. And then he allowed himself to get captured by a, by a, I think a, the consensus has been that he was not expecting that part. He was supposed to go after Sheridan to bring him home. Like, like we never, we never really know what it was. You and I can, can conjecture unless did you, I don't know one who was, did you catch something that I missed? 
just just that when it was coming over, he was just like, "Oh my god, what's happening?" Like he was not like he was shocked and surprised okay. when the shot. And it was yeah. the scene was great too because the shadow literally came over him when it yeah. happened. So he was not expecting. And so he gets sucked into the ship because I wasn't sure if he was inside the ship or if he was had like just attached himself to the ship like a stowaway. Like I, I well, because really we know. Sure. We know they can attach, like they grab each other and yeah. fly off. We've seen them do that to damage shadow yeah. ships. So maybe they, I don't know if he was inside but, I mean, it or not. But we've seen this in sci-fi before. Somebody has a little tiny shuttle pod and they go and they just sort of land on a big enemy ship and they hide out like right there on their hull. And, and wait to get put out with the trash and go out in an asteroid field and then get swallowed by a, find Minox and yeah, yeah it's yeah. pretty or, tried and true. Or they're going to take them back to their base. And show me where you like whatever it is, right? Uh, so so Garibaldi gets sucked in, and then at some point the shadows hand him over to Psycor. We think we have him on I don't a know that. No, well, no, we do because the guy. Well, I mean, the guy came into the cell on the ship, and he had a Psycor badge on. But the Psy Psycor and the shadows are are part and parcel and tied together. I'm not convinced it was actually Psycor or just a, a dude wearing a Psycor outfit. And maybe I'm, maybe I got my red yarn I, going back here quite a bit. I think you do. I think, I think that him, they were clearly showing us the badge. And so, and, I mean, you could be right. They could be trying to fake us out about that. But for now, I think our information is to say that was Psycor. Yeah. And then the next thing we see is this thing says, program upload complete or something of that nature or activate program and Garibaldi's eyes open and then they jettison whatever life pod he's in and give him back and now he's all whatever Garibaldi like I don't know if he, what remember what happened to Talia where she had that that personality mm -hmm. so I don't know if he got something like that done to him um I presumably he's all be shifty worse. and shaky because of what's happened to him but i don't think that's it i think something's something's yeah. left with his mind i think that we've seen this episode before and it was called a spider in the web and this he's a cyber zombie i think garibaldi might be dead mm. like that mars the mars uh yeah. was mars first yeah. like that dude was and just has the control or you know or whatever which i which we never really got a clear answer if that was tied to the talia stuff or not but no um, because they dissected her yeah <laughs> in a throwaway line they dissected her jeff i'm still so mad about that like I like i understand there were issues with the actress i understand she went on to another television show hmm. what could have been with that storyline of her coming back as bad talia yeah could have been so could good have been so good so good and i'm really mad that it was just a nope we're getting her off the show because we didn't like her anymore and oh yeah now we dissected her yeah she is not coming back right but yeah so my my operating theory right now is that this is the tie back to a spider in the web and garibaldi as we know him is no longer on the board how sad does that make you because we've loved garibaldi Garibaldi, he was my favorite character in the first season. Yeah. And then he's been kind of inconsistent since then. Right. And I mean, we, we back in a lot of the third season had a lot of not great things to say about him, but still it's Garibaldi, man. Like right. if that's, if it's true and it comes out that he's got some thing in him and I don't know if it'd be Lita this time. Cause there's no Talia, you know, who goes and tries to extract it yep. from him. And, and it turns out he's dead. Like, oh, that's, mm. That's good storytelling. It's in fear. It'll be infuriating. Well, because we're going to, I mean, we're now going to watch Garibaldi one with an attitude mm -hmm. and, and that's just going to be annoying to be frank yeah. with you, you know, cause he doesn't have the attitude. Like Jerry Doyle doesn't have the attitude that the actor for uh, Talia had right. to, to, cause she was great. Like that. The second she transformed, she became one of my favorite characters. Absolutely. In the whole scene. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't think, I don't think, I don't think Jerry Doyle has that gear. Yeah. At least not from what we've seen. Right, right. So yeah, um, I did love in Med Lab because uh, Zach brought him in. Yeah, I thought it was cool too. Zach apparently leading the Star Fury wing. Like, dude, Zach stop. had Zach had the most chutzpah I've seen out of him in any episode to date. Yeah, in this he's like, hey, here's this. This is the problem. I'm going. And Ivanova's and or Delenn, Delenn's like, yeah, it's like, go. Yeah. Oh, dude, go. when he walked in with this, and I'm sure he's had this uniform on for a handful of episodes, you know, but we got to, I mean, 
we got a good look at this new uniform he's got on. He's got those shoulder pads yeah. that make his his shoulders all pointy. And I'm like, I'm watching him. And I, all of a sudden, I start looking at everybody else in the show, Delenn, Londo, Veer, and I'm going, oh, Jeff, these guys are into shoulder pads just like Star Trek is. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's sad but true. So many shoulder pads. But his were just like, dang. Yeah. <laughs> You know what? Yeah. Maybe they're propping him up to be a little more authoritative and stuff because he's going to replace Garrett, but he's going to be the new head of security. Somebody's so, got to step uh, in and do it. Yeah. Which is going to be, that's going to make it bittersweet, right? Like I love to see Zach stepping up and doing more stuff, yeah. but, uh, but there was a cool scene. He gets Garibaldi into med lab and he asked Dr. Franklin, he's like, dude, is he going to be okay? And Dr. Franklin did like, it was so subtle. It was just this quick moment, but I'm like, that was super cool. As they, after they're done talking, he's like, yeah, he should be okay. We don't really know. We're going to see what happens. And Zach's like, okay, man. And then Dr. Franklin looks at him. He says, good job on this one, Zach. And that was it. Just gave him a little, you know, out of boy. And I was like, dude, that's good. That's yeah. super cool. Yeah. I like it. I like it. Um, Jeff, can, can we talk about the, uh, the opening scene with Ivanova? Hey, this, this is. This does not beat uh, Sinclair and Garibaldi putting Ivanova to sleep. That was that was epic. Right? That's that's the best opening sequence. This does not beat Sheridan and Delenn on a date eating dinner. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, this, but this is going to be. I'm I'm going to go ahead and slot this in as like in at least the top ten funniest scenes of Babylon Five. Right? It was it was great. Um. Ivanova has been practicing Minbari like Marcus told her to a year ago. Yeah. And so, cool. so cool. she's trying, man, she's trying, she's trying. I loved it. And, she's and everybody's on her side, right? right. The, and she's like, if anyone laughs at her, they will answer to me. <laughs> right. right. Um, but yeah, I always oh, just so funny. I, and you know what I loved about that? was watching Delenn and Marcus did a bit too, because they're clearly laughing at her. Yeah. Like they're doing everything they can to stop laughing at her because they appreciate what she's done. Like it's, it's, it is possible to speak the truth, get done what you need to get done and still protect people's feelings without lying to them. Right. You know, cause De they never lied. And this wasn't an, an act of omission or anything like that. Like it was just a, a Dylan's Dylan's words are true. You know, in the heat of battle, you actually need to be able to think this way and not just speak it. And you're not good at speaking it yet. Yeah. Um, but so, good on you for trying. That's great. Well, you can go with you. Uh -huh. <laughs> you can go play. You can do your stuff. It's yep. great. That's great. Yep. Yep. Uh, I, I, I loved this scene. I thought it was, it was so good. Yeah. I thought it was cool too. Cause it was a callback right at the end of the hour of the wolf in her little, um, in her journal, she was like, I got some ideas on how to pick up on captain Sheridan's work, but I'm going to need some help. It was just kind of left there hanging. Uh -huh. I think this was it. Her idea was I'm going to go find the first ones, which I thought was going to be an ongoing part of the third season Yay. where Ivanova and Marcus were going to go out. So, I mean, I'm an entire season off, but, uh, it's better, you know, it's cool that they went out recruiting. It just makes sense. Okay. So Marcus and Ivanova going out, having conversations that you didn't quite see coming, I guess. No, no, not even a little bit. Like, I mean, what is it about Ivanova where Marcus yep. felt that that was a thing to share Veer? Felt that that was a thing he had to like all the people who've never been to sixth base before feel they have to share that with Ivanova. <laughs> oh, and we know Ivanova has been there. So, um, sixth base and all the way around. Right. Right. Uh, she's just such a great listener. I think is what I guess, it is. I guess. And you know, she looks at, she looks at, at Marcus and she's just like, ah, oh, that's great. I'm sure somebody's gonna really appreciate that one day and he's like yes and i hope it's you right <laughs> but i'm not gonna say that but i'm it's but i'm wearing it on my face right? so right? Uh, so apparently right he's got it was a great scene though yeah. i loved it yeah. it's just i mean because 
Marcus kind of came in and they tried to give him a little bit of like the not really a the, not not a bad guy story, but like bad things have happened to me story. You know, he's got the traumatic upbringing. There's nobody left. Everyone that I love dies. Mm-hmm. Sort of a thing. But then to like add to that that like he because it's I don't think this was ever a case of like failing to round the bases. This was a choice that he choice made. he made. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, mm-hmm. absolutely. Um, and and by the way, I know that there are people out there, and and you're few and far between, who choose to wait. Uh, and you have my absolute and total respect. I tried doing that and didn't do very well. Uh, same, same. <laughs> I, you know, I ain't gonna lie. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I gotta say though, Marcus had a sweet line. I mean, it was a killer line. He says, people have reported seeing godlike figures here, and since neither you nor I were here, it must be the first ones. <laughs> that was so go. good. It was so good on his part. That was good. Yeah, that but the whole thing with them, you know, led to finding the Vorlon Vorlons in a fold of hyperspace. <sighs> Jeff, I still have problems with the way they use hyperspace in this show. I, I was going to say what was, that it's how they've designed this universe to work and it's fine, but it bugs me. What was, what was that second season episode that we just got? I mean, we got textbook thesis level dissertations from people on how hyperspace works. I forget. I forget the um, it was, it was uh, not the long dark, the other, a distant star, distant star. There you yes. go. Sure. Would have been cool. If in this thing where we're going to teach you all about hyperspace, they mentioned there are folds and waves or some, something not here two seasons later, like, Oh, by the way, <laughs> they had this it's little technology. They were able to do a thing. Yeah. Which I'm sitting there going, isn't that how wormholes work is it's actually folding space. Mm-hmm. Like, like, uh, yeah. That's how you travel in Dune, right? You have the guild navigators that use the spice to fold space together, and there's you move without moving. Yeah, That's, are, are they in fold space? Like, is that what was happening? I don't but know. That, but. but can you just go into the fold? It's like the idea that you just go be in hyperspace. Like, uh, like it's, well, it's like you're not even mentioned that's out there. It still bugs me. It still bugs. Me. It's like I, yeah, and well, I think I think I can get behind. We're hanging out in hyperspace waiting, but what? where it starts to get iffy is right here. It's like, I'm going to hide out in hyperspace in hyperspace. Right. You know what I mean? Like, Oh no, it's not just hyperspace. It's like hyper hyperspace or right. Whatever. It's like, Oh, okay. And then not only are we going to like hide and tuck away in here, we're going to have a massive planet killing fleet with the biggest M effing ship you have ever seen. Yeah. I think it was massive. Yeah. And oh, it's just there. It's just, Hanging out. Let's just be clear. The Vorlon and and also the shadows, these are not hive mind situations where if you take out the queen, everybody else goes away. Sure hope not. I really, really hope that's not what this is. Um, Especially if Lorian is the, the queen for both of them, like the hive mind leader for <laughs> both, and you just take out Lorian and you win the whole thing. Right, right. Somebody just freaked out when I said that. Right. <laughs> right. Somebody got in a car accident. <laughs> uh, so... Sheridan had a really good moment where he recapped what they told us in the episode Zaha doom at the end of season three and just kind of brought it back in because there was, there was a bit of like, okay, we heard it from them, but those weren't the most trustworthy people. So now Sheridan's come in and said the age clarified the whole thing for people who've never seen the show before. They're just now catching mm-hmm. up with Babylon five in the TV run. Uh, there used to be these people long ago, two groups decided to stay around and help the new people, the shadows and the Vorlons. They just had different ideas of how to help. Like that's really their idea. It's just different ideas of how to help. The shadows are not trying to control the universe. They're not bent on, on, on uh, domination. They're bent on helping people evolve. And you do that by survival of the fittest. Right. The conflict. Yeah. And, uh, the, the Vorlons are like, no, we're going to help people through art and, and unification. And, yeah. And yeah. all of this sort of stuff. Um, and so that's, that's where we are with these two groups. Like that's, that's the deal. 
Yeah. And really when Sheridan was describing it in the office, uh -huh. which was cool. Cause like you said, it, it recapped what happened in Zaha doom and then added in what Lorian uh -huh. gave him on Zaha doom right. in the hour. Of, no, the hour of the wolf, but the last episode, you know, whatever happened to Mr. Garibaldi. Mm -hmm. But the, what I kind of took out of that ultimately is what he's saying is neither of these are good or bad. Right. Right. They just are. Yeah. It's just, it's two different ways of looking at it. Mm -hmm. That's really, really what it is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We see, we see the shadows as evil because they cause aggression, yeah. right? Either from them or through between other races. So we see that as bad, right? but come to find out, um, Vorlons are just as bad. Yes. They just, they just weren't so in the open about it. You know right. I mean? I mean, and, and, and I don't know, like there's, there's a whole, oh, where, wait, 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 were the Vorlons just as bad? That's what I was going to say. There's a whole conversation. Well, they killed 4 million people, but that's different though. That's, Is it? that's a different situation because the way that I saw that was okay. The shadows have now come and directly killed one of the Vorlons. They have attacked and killed a Vorlon. And however that hurts the whole, right? And now the Vorlons are like, okay, enough of these effers, we're cutting them out. We're, we're getting rid of every single one of them and we're taking out, a, a, what, what's that? You know, every, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. What, Ivanova said something like, like you got to take everything out. Mm -hmm. And, and if you take it, it, what Franklin was saying something about, yeah, but so what if you take the, the healthy stuff to go with it? And they're like, I don't care. I got scooping it all out. And we're going to get rid of it and then we're going to leave everybody here and we're going to i guess they're going to go away or they're going to stay but they're and this is not them changing their mind this is they're going after the shadows and everyone else who happens to be in the way is just collateral damage they're they don't care anymore because it's self-preservation at this point for them yeah but i also think if, if you look back kosh old kosh did a really good job of not ever engaging with the shadows. Like he would consult, he would give advice. It was Sheridan jumping down his throat and they get in that big fight in the hallway right. that led them to launch a small mm -hmm. fleet out to go take the shadows out. That then led to the shadows coming and taking out Kosh. I think the thing was there were like, there were rules. They had rules and Lorian, I think kind of explained some of the rules and some of it was like, we're not going to be the ones fighting, right? Like we're developing these nascent species out here to grow and evolve and whatever, mm -hmm. and we'll do our things. But the moment the Vorlon attacked the shadows, the game changed. Hey, now, now it's good. And it could have been, you took us out. We took out Kosh. We're good. It could have been that, right? But no, now they took out Kosh. Now the Vorlons are wanting to get get some of theirs back, and there's still this hanging piece of Sheridan opening an unexpected door. We assumed that was him falling down in the Sarlacc pit and somehow getting to Lorien. But did he open that unexpected door by convincing Old Kosh to to attack the Shadows? Mm. But I also think, in saying that they're just as bad as the Shadows. If we look at some of the things the Vorlons have done, we go back to season one and that incredible episode, Death Walker. Here's a person with a technology that's going to head off and cause serious problems, right? Right. Nope. Boom. Vorlons come out, wipe her off the map. Not even, not even a consideration. He walks in, takes her out, walks back. Right. Almost nothing said. Then fast forward to coming of shadows and everything that happened after the Narn Centauri war, millions, billions of people dying, right? Just, I mean, death, destruction, horrible things going on. People are begging for help from the Vorlons, from the Minbari. Vorlons don't help. They're like, nope, not even going to show up to the council meetings, actually, as you talk about these things. Right. So when a thing happens that can rip everyone apart, like Death Walker, they step in and blow her out of the water. When something happens that has the capacity and the potential to unify and bring people together, like the Narn Centauri war, they're hands off. Even if that means millions of people are going to die, ultimately it could bring people together. In my, in my mind, that's just as bad as showing up and actively killing those million people. 
or millions. Is it though? I mean, it, okay. So let's go back to star Trek. Isn't that the prime directive? It is, but they've already violated the prime directive. I mean, they took out death Walker they're, they're, if they were consistent, no, but, that's, but, but that's not, no, no. You're allowing these people to grow on their own. And when somebody comes in, who's overpowered, well, now we're going to step in, but we're going to allow these folks to grow and to fight and to war with each other. If that's what they choose to do or to grow peace. And they've got to figure that stuff out for themselves, but we're not going to let people come in and, and from the outside, do something to them. But I don't think she was from the, she wasn't from the outside. The Dilgar were just one of those worlds. I think I could buy that if they did that across the board, if like, so when the Minbari and humans were at war with each other, if they came in and put a stop to that, uh -huh. if they, but it's, but it's, it's literally, Hey, this is going to divide people. The death Walker thing is going to divide people. So we're going to shut it down over here. The Narn Centauri thing is going to unite people. So we're going to let it happen. The prime directive is about non-interference period, not because of the outcome. Whereas the Vorlons are like, no, we we're going to make sure that you move forward in unifying yourself. Even if that means the death of countless people. Mm. Prime directive talk, but. I don't know. It's still a growing thought in my head. Yeah. I, can we, but. can we, can we just say this in agreement though, Jeff, uh, Kosh two electric boogaloo is an asshole. Dude's bad news. Yeah. Yeah. Big time. Um, what I, and, and apparently it's not just him and I, I, this isn't new news. This, the Vorlon as a whole, like Lita's told us, like there's something happening with the Vorlon, like, like bad stuff's happening all the way around with those Vorlon, right? And this new one in particular is just the worst. But I guess the question is, is this one the worst or is this one the way like this, is this how the Vorlons are and old Kosh was the exception? Like, was he tainted? Oh, yeah. from being around the other races so much. Well, isn't this new Kosh? Wasn't he the one who was on Minbar? I think so. Long? I don't know that. I don't know that, but see, that's the thing. That and if he's going to be tainted, let him be tainted by the Minbar. He should be dope. He should be super cool. Look what happened to Veer. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, so Lita oversteps her bounds. Let's just say that. Okay. First of all, oh, okay. Oh, oh, oh. Were these gills she had in her neck when she was in that room with him? So I think, I, I think I pieced all that together. So she said that she let them alter her. Uh huh. So whatever that atmosphere is that they're in, I think they altered her so she could breathe that atmosphere. And then she puts the mask off and on to kind of like hide it. Like she doesn't want people to know that she's altered, but they also enhanced her psychic abilities. Or telepathic ability. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to go back to the gill thing though. But when she's not in that room, they disappear and you can't see. Yeah. She just got a nor like she had a Cardassian neck. Like it was <laughs> when she had those gills. But then when she wasn't in there, it was just normal, nice, thin, skinny little neck. Mm. That's all three. That was all three. Yeah. But yeah, it, it, it comes back nice. That's very clean. They did a great job. Yeah. Really good reconstructive surgery for her. <laughs> But she said, she said a line when she was describing that I let you do these things to me because I believed, right? What did she believe? Like th they're going to take everybody out. I don't think so. Cause no. she seems to be on team Babylon five. Sure. She is. Yeah. Well, I, I think she believed in them. She believed in, in Kosh. She believed in the good. I believed, I believed you guys were here to help folks advance in a good way. Yeah. Not a bad, yeah. that's what I believed. And I believed you guys, I believed you guys were the ones to help this, that you guys were good and now you're not. And, uh, so, she, but she oversteps her balance. She tries to read him yeah, and find out what's going on. And he turns around and goes, you want to know what's going on in my mind? And then he gives it to her. Yeah. And she screams. It turns out we've got fricking Vorlons with fricking lasers on their heads <laughs> as he blasts her. And I want to know what she saw. Yeah. 
Did she see the attack plans? And that's why she was in her room and Ivanova had to come in. She's like, you know, you know, I feel like she, they, he had to have shown her more than just that. I, what, what, what was it? Would that have made her scream though? Yeah, I like, ah, I can't believe it. No, like it sound. And that wasn't a, that wasn't a, I can't believe the script. That was a painful scream. Yeah. Well, I think too, it's been pretty well established that anytime he interacts with her, he goes out of his way to make it painful for her. Yeah. There was that pretty awkward, um, line from her about when he, when he pulls out of her, <laughs> you came you know, out of me really it. hard. Yeah. <laughs> that was a little, little on the nose. Listen, <laughs> that's what she said. Well, I, after that joke, this feels disingenuous and I've. <laughs> apologize but and i i don't have experience here so i'm just going to pose the question i don't know that you can even answer it but just to ponder but this really felt to me the entire kosh new kosh and leader relationship like an allegory for domestic violence you're right i have no frame of reference for that of my own personal experience i can see where you're going with that and that's an interesting idea to see it does that give us that as an allegory that's that's interesting uh i have a personal role i don't comment on stuff that i don't have experience with or i try not to anyway i don't, I don't mm -hmm. say i'm always successful with it but so i'm not going to comment on it further but that does that that seems like that could work jeff i think i yeah and again i'm, I'm in the same place like i don't want to speculate or i just i'm, I'm, I'm yeah. putting the question out there because it yeah it really gave me pause um I, I, jeff all i've got left here is there's there's the cartagia jakar stuff um and then i think just the overall bit of sheridan and lorian and them being back well if, if it's cool let's do the sheridan lorian because honestly like i don't have a lot okay there like it happened it was cool but i don't have a whole lot on there <laughs> one thing i did notice yeah. is when drazi the drazi guy was up on the thing and there was the other guy do, do we know what he that looks like a Mark hab. You remember the Mark hab? The guys that got mm -hmm. wiped off only different. Yeah. He had a bigger head. Yeah. It, it was like, the, we're going to use the Mark hab makeup, but we're going to change it just a bit is what like, we didn't throw it all out. We still have some in the back. We can use that. Right. Right. We got some, but I, I thought it was, I thought his outfit was striking and that he had like, you know, whatever clothes on, but he had these two sashes that were crossing over him. Uh -huh. One was green and one was purple. It was not. Yes. And he was right next to a drowsy. Oh, are you serious? That's I wonder if he's like like the 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 master of them all or something. Or he's that's or the real he's story. Just uh, uh, what's what's the word? Um, uh, he's razzing him. He he he's 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 appropriating the the, the Drazi culture. <laughs> he's like, oh, I do a green and purple. I can do that too. And it's like this is very offensive. Actually, uh, it's green or purple, yeah. not yeah. and. Or the costuming department sensitive. was like, Hey, we've got all these sashes. Let's here, but yeah, put them on. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Sheridan walks in and, and I mean, I, I don't know about you, Jeff. I totally call Sheridan walking back in. So oh, yeah. No one's ever returned. And then you see like footsteps on it. Like, well, obviously that's Sheridan who's returning. Like, uh, well, when the ship was landing, the little transport ship, yeah. you could see their silhouettes and it was clearly, and also they're just going to let the ship dock right oh let's just sit and wait and see what happens right well they got the codes uh must must you have minbari circling the ship you got these new guns pointing and you're just oh let's just let them land and see what happens not a good look and he brings lorian with i didn't expect him to bring lorian with him yeah that was a surprise um and you already talked about garibaldi and them in the thing being like hey who's this dude uh I, I, one thing is sheridan gonna leave delin I don't think so because there's this thing she you know she's meeting up on the scaffold and he says uh i will never leave you oh. that is the kind of line that we have learned jms will drop and pick it up in what do we got we got a season and change left here jeff like uh, oh oh jeff oh gosh jeff she's I'm, his reason for living right you know what i mean jeff oh, i'm out of star trek references i can't do it but we've we know We've seen this in another show. 
Yeah. Where you get to the end and the well, guy has to leave for various reasons. And we've talked and wait, they talked about uh in the future scenes of War Without End, they talked about um the great sacrifices, sacrifices they had to make. Yeah. Maybe yeah. maybe that had something to do with it. Maybe though also, uh-huh. maybe Sheridan was just saying the first thing that came to mind as he noticed Delenn ran like suddenly seeing a spotlight shining on someone uh-huh. and going out of her way to run up and also be in that spotlight. <laughs> Did you get that at all? Like no, I, I, no, that was dude. That's her man, and she's pulled to her man. And if he happens to be in the spotlight, he's in the spotlight. I don't think she was trying to take that from him at all. I didn't catch maybe, that at all. Maybe I am just not a romantic. And if you ask my wife, she will she will tell you that. I am not a romantic person. But I totally had Naroon right here. He was sitting right behind where this keeper is usually on my neck. He was he was right behind me saying, look, she's politicking again. Look at her making sure she's a part of the big scene that's going on. I don't know. She she's not an idiot, right? I yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to chalk that up to you not being a romantic. Cause that was, okay. that, that was, that was purely a love move right there. That's fair. I do think though, and I, I said it in the recap, I got to put it here again. There was so much tension, stress, uh-huh. everything built up around. We have one week. We have one week till the Delenn, you made this up as a manager, as a project manager, as a leader, like, oh my, this is why projects fail. Hey, we're going to go do this thing. Yeah. Okay, uh, it's going to take us six weeks to get a nope. We're going to do it in two. But what? Like, why? Why? Right. Well, so we have dramatic tension. That's why. I got to push it forward, right? That's what mm-hmm. good leaders do. Apparently. All right. So let's talk court jesters. Well, Brent, I would like to introduce a new segment uh, to our show really? here in this uh, fourth season. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time for Jeff to review the Stations of the Cross as told through Jakar. The first station of the cross is that Jesus was condemned to death and crowned with thorns, which includes the scourging at the pillar. Huh. Jakar tied up to a pillar and a dude whipping him is almost beat for beat what happens in the first station of the cross. But hey, that's not all. In the second station is when Jesus accepts his cross, which I think is where Jakar accepted Londo's deal. That was in the last episode where he's like, yeah, I'll do this. But today we got that first one and we also got the third station, which was Jesus falls for the first time. So as he's dancing around in his little jester outfit and whatever, and dude trips him, Jakar falls for the first time. We have three of the 14 stations so far. There's 14 of these things. Yeah. Yeah. And they get pretty repetitive. Like he falls three times Yeah, and and there's stuff. I, 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 if they fit three in a, each episode, I, I still think that's not fast enough. I don't see this. I don't see this yeah. going on. Yeah, th- this is this is like, uh, yeah, I Jeff, I got to tell you, I didn't think that the Narn Centauri War was going to last like all of season two. True, true. and it did. So, I, like, I want to sit here and be like, yeah, this is only like six or seven episodes, but this could go on for a while because at some point doesn't this have to drive jakar and londo back together uh, yes like, that, that's in whatever my, form that is like it's got to drive them back together like it, it's gonna the bond right, right when right. i think you you uh, disabused me of thinking of it being a friendship but this is going to drive that bond for them for sure i wonder how he's it occurs to me i'm just i'm just throwing something out here jeff because i'm trying to think like how's londo going to save jakar right cartagia cartagia said hey listen he's a gift and i know he said at one point like i know i said he was a gift but i got to get a scream out of him yeah and so he's got a scream right he's he's got it um if he's a gift is it possible that jakar becomes like londo's slave 
Ooh. And Londo makes him a slave to protect him. Maybe. You know what I mean? And that's why, like, like he, he Jakar really becomes like Londo's servant, at least on the surface, but like really he's able to give more him, of a partnership there than anything. Like he's able to give him a little like safety. You know, like yeah, I come to my quarters, you're gonna serve me in Veer, you can sleep for a while and rest. I would buy that if if Cartagia wasn't freaking crazy yeah you know what i mean and because he just waffles so much i here he's your gift he can become your slave and then he shows up he's like i need your slave because i'm going to do this random thing yeah. I, I just don't see him letting go yeah but i mean the other thing is i mean at some point they've got to kill cartagia because londo has to ascend to the throne yeah it's going to happen yeah 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 i do i i, I mean i've said it every episode of this season so far, but this, this one, my favorite Cartagia moment in this one, when was in like, Oh, even my best tortures are pain technicians since they've been organized, right. like just poo pooing on a group of workers organizing. Like I am so into him as a bad guy. He is awesome. He's disgusting. Yeah. He is absolutely disgusting. Um, Oh, Yeah, I, I've used my I've used my references. I'm, I'm not. Look at that. So you got to be you got to think about this. I, I think I know where you're going. I'm not going to give it to you, but uh, well, then you take that, it. I was, was going to say him I, as I, a torture to somebody else. The what? Comparing comparing Cartagia and how he behaved as a torture to somebody else. Oh, I wasn't going there with it. Oh, okay, I was just going with like, was, what a great job they did making Ducat goal gold ducat a villain that you loved right you're just like god he's so he, he's sick and crazy but i love it when he's on screen like that's cartagia for me i don't love when he's on screen cartagia when cartagia's on screen I love when he's on screen no really not at all oh i do not at all everything about him makes me just revolt like i i just yeah i will say this though i thought this was this was rather funny they've got him come out with these red hands stained with jakar's blood yeah and he has this little bowl next to him that he could wash at any moment but he chooses not to he's just whatever and then he goes to wash his hands nothing comes off his hands i know his hands it's come blood. out of that bowl just as red as they went in and yeah i know they showed us the red water that he poured into the thing which that's pretty you know, it'll be good for the plant like that dude is sick and twisted but i just like i didn't i i wouldn't necessarily expect them to become clean but 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 something something they <laughs> were literally the exact same i was just impressed that none of it was like splashed on his white, white he had some on his sleeves garb. they did he stuff did. on his sleeves and i don't know how easy that is for them to take out of the costume because those costumes are expensive yeah yeah so i had a couple kind of um i don't know i think cool notes on this one one, I thought it was interesting at first that they focused on 40 lashes, 40 lashes that gets high. The electro whip, yep. you know, ramps up and you die, right? 40 lashes. That's a thing yep. in Deuteronomy, yep. right? So if you, uh, if you get more than 40 lashes, that's inhumane right? on there. And so, uh, the Jewish people from that, those days forward had a rule that you could only sentence someone to up to 39 lashes because you didn't want to make a mistake and action, you know, like lose count and accidentally do more than 40. So 39 was, uh, was the cap. I thought this was a really well done way of slipping that reference in. Um, by the way, that number maintained throughout history in multiple cultures, like really, that was the same number that was instituted by the British empire. I believe that that was also supposed to be the same number that was instituted in America during its slavery. Although I don't think people followed it. Um, Probably not. Uh, but also you speak about the stations of the cross, 39 lashes is what Jesus himself received uh, yep. with the cat of nine tails. Right. Yeah. And they had to hold like that last one, like that to hold, uh, hold, hold a couple of the, of the things back so that he wouldn't get more than, than four. Yeah. Because even even though they were going to kill him, they couldn't they couldn't treat him as less than a human. Right. Yeah, that was a really great callback. So the scene between Londo and Jakar, where Londo was trying to tell him he needed to scream, and he was like, "You that that you can't. That is the most offensive thing ever to me." 
when I first watched that the first on the first on my first watch through, I was just like, dude, drop your macho pretense, suck it up, scream and like, come on, do it. But on my second watch through, I remembered the long twilight struggle when Narn's getting blasted, right? The mass drivers are coming down and somebody from the Narn homeworld calls Jakar and they're like, dude, you're the last member of the Kari and I'm going to have to ask you to do the most difficult thing I've ever asked you to do before. Right. And then the scene cuts and he goes and he, he's got tears in his eyes as he asks Sheridan for sanctuary. And you and I were just like, well, what else? Like that can't be the worst thing they've ever asked him to do. Mm -hmm. But it was because that was screaming. That was admitting weakness and pain and all of those things. And I guess that's a part of the Narn culture. I never really picked up on and maybe that's on me mm -hmm. but i was able on my second watch to tie this back to that and be like oh okay now i get it that was i get where that would be the hardest thing ever to ask him and then in the end when he did scream it's it's just it's it's, it's interesting to me because culturally that's a low point for jakar but i think personally it's probably the bravest thing he has ever done in his entire life right And of course, my last note, Veer is all in on killing this dude. Like that's that that's yeah, that's how bad he is. You you remember when I said no? Forget that I'm in. Let's go. Kill yeah. him. Kill them all. Well, Jeff, uh, with that, I think we have reached that part of the show where it is time to boil it all down and see if this episode has any of those deep moral messages we're looking for. Is it holding up a mirror to society? Is it giving us hope that we'll be better in the future? And at the same time, how is it doing it in a Babylon 5 way? You, my friend, are going to rate this episode on a scale of 0 to 5 Delta Furies to see how strong the message is and how Babylon 5 it was. Jeff, what you got? I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. I will permit it to pass over me and through me. And when it has gone past, I will turn the inner eye to see its path. Where the fear is gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. This is the litany of fear from Dune. And it demonstrates how we should face our fear. How we should face our fear. This, epi this episode showed us the exact opposite of that. In the Zocalo protest scene, the masses were so easily swayed they were quick to turn on delenn they even attacked physically attacked her and lanier but when sheridan showed up and he said some words yeah they were great words but he said some words they immediately flipped and they were all team minbari team delenn team right. sheridan just like that after that speech they're they were excited they were cheering it was supposed to be this big hooray moment my heart broke in that moment. That's our entire history of humanity. It's our current day, what's happening right now. And apparently it's going to be our future as well. We just go whatever way the wind happens to be blowing. You know, Rush actually has a song about this of course from their do. snakes and arrows. And they do exactly right. I love these times that I can pull in a rush song, but it's from their snakes and arrows record. And it says we can only go the way the wind blows. We can only bow to the here and now or be broken down blow by blow. The masses are afraid. They live in constant fear, fear of judgment, fear of missing out, fear of whatever it is that we're being told to fear. In this scene, we have two sides that are honestly both kind of right, but almost anyone there wants to do is be left alone and to be safe or at least, you know, be able to consider themselves to be safe. If keeping a low profile with the shadows does that, they're all for it. If blasting Zaha Doom does that, well, they're all for that too. But they don't know what's going to make that happen. What they do know is the guy saying that we should go low is up on a pedestal and he's yelling. So, well, better listen to him. He pro he's probably right. And that's like, that's for both Drazi the Drazi guy and for Sheridan. 
the people are afraid to look contrary to the people around them. They're afraid to stand up with their own thoughts, with their own ideas. So they just go the way the wind blows. So here's my conundrum on this one, right? Like, th- what a message. Like, just don't go the way the wind blows, right? This is a painful and very necessary message. So I can go high, right, on this one. Or I can go low because ultimately it shows us that we don't get any better. We don't grow from this. We are still held captive to fear even in the end of the 23rd century. And everything, everything in this episode was motivated by fear. It wasn't just that protest scene. That's just what brought it right to my attention. But we have Londo fearing for the future of the Centauri. And he's making all of his choices based on that. Jakar fearing for his pride and his cultural humility. We have Lita fearing the Vorlon. Garibaldi fearing the unknown and and something that we don't know anything about yet. Lorian literally fearing the worst and Marcus fearing, well, I mean, I could have gone down a path of virtue and romance for this section, you know, but it's, it's fine. So I'll just, I'll lay off Marcus like everyone else in his life has. (laughs) So I'm going to do it. I am going to give this one because it has the concept of fear and how it drives us to do both good and bad things. But the way that we so rarely make those decisions based on us and what matters to us, but more on what way the wind is blowing. Oh, it doesn't get more Babylon five than that. This is a five Delta Fury episode. You know why I like that is because it wasn't just one plot line that was delivering that message. All the different threads within this episode, as you just pointed out, were delivering that same message just in the unique way of the particular characters that they were facing at the time. Um, I'm with it. I like it. Cool. But we are creating the absolute 100% completely accurate and definitive ranking of the fourth season of Babylon 5. Currently, our rankings are in number one, whatever happened to Mr. Garibaldi, and number two, the hour of the wolf. And Brent, Mm -hmm. this is on you, my friend. Where are you ranking the summoning? Well, we only are one, two, and three. I know. And we liked whatever happened to Mr. Garibaldi better than we did the Hour of the Wolf. The Hour of the Wolf, if I remember right, was uh, it was another one of those just it was it was hey, here's what happens next. Like we had the big finale last season, here's the week after, and Sheridan's missing and we're picking up the rubble from that, right? Um whatever happened to Mr. Garibaldi advanced some stuff. It showed us what happened to Sheridan. Barely showed us what happened to Mr. Garibaldi. Uh, and in this one, again, I think this episode is going to get, I'm going to use your word, Jeff, eclipsed by the end of the season. Um, because I, you're right. I think there are things that were started in this episode that are going to be huge. But we're not going to look back on them and remember that they started in this episode. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I do think that whatever happened to Mr. Garibaldi is going to be more of a memorable episode for what happened there. So I'm going to put this one right in between at our new number two. And I'm saying this to say, you guys, please save your comments. This does not mean I didn't like this episode. I actually liked this episode. This is a fine episode. I just think we're going to we're going to catch more of these storylines that are, that are happening here in future episodes. I think it was hard. We talked about it in the season three wrap up, like that's such a great season, you know, and it was, you got to shake him out. And I think you in that wrap up, put it, put it really well. And I'm, I'm going to say it wrong, but it's basically, there are these many episodes that were amazing, incredible, timeless, I'll always watch again this many that were great, awesome and amazing. And this many that were super, super good. And then one that was pure unadulterated garbage and should be criminally prosecuted. That's, that's kind of where we're at. 17 is missing. It is not. Yeah. That was actually, and that's a, I, a good, really good category. I liked that's, that episode quite a bit. It's fun. But yeah, so far with these three, they're great. They're awesome. And, yeah. and I mean, really, this is, as I talk about the stations of the cross, this is the cross that you and I have to bear, Brent. Uh-huh. We have to rank these things. Yes. 
we have to choose what's going to go on top of some of the greatest pieces of television ever written. And we're doing that. Oh dear listener for you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Yeah, I'm going to let it go. Never mind. Sorry. All that build up. I'm only pushing a little bit. Yep. Go ahead. Well, that's it for the summoning next week. We like to play this little game where I drop the name of the episode. The next one's going to be called falling toward apotheosis, but I dropped that episode probably the first time Brent has ever heard that, but we're going to guess what this episode is going to be about based on everything we know up to this episode so far. And the title alone, Brent, you get to go first. What do you think falling toward apotheosis is going to be about? What I was going to say a moment ago, I think what we're going to find at least with these early episodes of season four, maybe even season four as a whole, is it's going to be it's going to become harder and harder to delineate individual episodes and we're going to be looking at the season as a whole ah, did we set a precedent i think yeah like war without end yeah yeah but you but you know what i mean like it's it's going to be really hard to think about here's this episode and then this episode and then this episode and how this episode handles it is and even trying to remember what episode did what as much as it is just here's the whole thing you know, and, and that's, and that's where it is. That being said, that plays into this next episode. What did you say? It's called something fall. Yeah. Falling toward apotheosis. I've never heard that word before in my life. I'm a fairly well-read person. I have a fairly large vocabulary, despite what my children think. Uh, and my wife thinks sometimes. <laughs> apotheosis apotheosis reminds me of the word apothecary it also reminds me of the word apostasy and an apostasy is when someone leaves their faith and given how things are shaking out somebody leaving their faith i don't think this is jakar who's kind of a priest among his people uh abandoning jaquan or anything like that or jakosh um but maybe this does have something to do with Kosh or specifically the Vorlons who are up to something. They're amassing for war. They're doing something they shouldn't be doing. They are leaving the faith. They are, they are, uh, not being the force for good in the universe that they, that we've propped them up to be. Let's put it that way. You know what I mean? Like maybe they weren't really ever the force for good but we've propped them up to be that, uh, or they've propped themselves. Um, so angels who are falling, uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to start with that. I think, I think that this, uh, falling towards apotheosis is something to do with the Vorlons leaving, like f forwarding that idea, leaving what they have established over the millennia of how they operate. You're going to come in and tell me the definition of apotheosis and it's kind of not going to mean that at all. Go ahead, Jeff. I'm going to, I am going to tell you the definition. I know. You the word it up? Did you look it up or did you know? I know it because of Battlestar Galactica. They have an episode called apotheosis. Okay. And I looked it up way back then. I was like, <laughs> apotheosis. That's a fun word. What is that? Okay. And it was one that stuck with me and it's so fitting. I don't know, like just all the stories going on this props up a lot of possibilities. So apotheosis uh -huh. is the process of becoming a God. The process of becoming a God. Yes. So when you think about like, uh, really like Greek Roman mythology and some of the early pagan, what we call pagan religions where people could be, or, or centauri religions for that matter, uh, -huh. uh that process of ascending to Godhood is called apotheosis. 
and falling toward uh -huh. means uh, that, that, that that's not necessarily happening intentionally <laughs> okay. or that it's coming at you. So I think we're going to get two big stories in this one. The first one is going to be Cartagia. Um, he made the deal with the shadows, you know, to make him a God. And he is now going to start learning. He's not going to know it, but Londo is going to recognize this pattern mm. of they made a deal and now they're going to come back wanting more. So the Vorlons are going after them and their bases. So they're going to want more land on Centauri Prime. And they're going to hold that godhood of Cartagia. This is going to be a lot of Morden. Yeah. Um, being, you know, being Morden. We might we might see more of his uh, transformation that he's going through. Maybe, maybe we get new Morden out of it. But he's going to be there um, holding Cartagia's godhood captive. But I think the other move towards divinity we're going to see is Sheridan and not necessarily in the Cartagia sense of becoming a God, but more in the Greek mythology sense of I'm going to go on a great quest. I'm going to slay uh, a mythical being and I am going to ascend to Godhood as a result. I think that Sheridan is going to fight legends. He's going to go one on one with the Kosh one. I think it's all going to come to a head and they're going to fight. And I don't think it's going to, I don't think it will end. You know what I mean? I think uh -huh. one of the two of them will leave or Lorian will, we'll, we'll learn more about Lorian, but this is going to be a massive step in Sheridan starting to be seen in that, ah, God, I wouldn't, I'm going to say savior, but I don't mean like savior. I mean like saving us from war kind of a role. Interesting. And we'll find out right here next week. Thank you all so much for joining us. Listen, we love when you leave us ratings and reviews. I love reading them here on the podcast. But if you could do one thing for me right now at this very moment, if you're watching us on YouTube, if you're listening to us on whatever podcast app you are, there's a share button. I want you to click that share button and I want you to send this to somebody you know who either needs to watch Babylon 5 or had watched it before. Just do us a huge favor. Give us that follow, subscribe, and share our show with somebody. Tell us about it. It would mean the absolute world to us. Brent, until next time. Hey, Jeff. Yeah, yeah, man, what's up? You know, it, it's kind of late, and um, I'm pretty tired, so I think I'm just going to head to bed now. <laughs> well, at least you still have a mattress. I mean, we're not some some deep space franchise. The station is about something. I changed the outro. You did change the outro. Yeah, move, shifted it up a little bit. I like it better because you get a little more instrument yep. on it. That was, a, that was a great call. Yep, good job. That's an episode. Club 65. So is we're, we're going to talk to Club 65 about this because we do tech to, talk to Club 65 about stuff. Um, Jeff and I were talking before this episode, trying to figure out how we're going to end it. We, we, we were struggling. How do we, how do we, you know, cause you guys know you got, you guys stick around. You guys listen to the jokes at the end where we try to do some sort of reference from the episode. And Jeff and I, I'll, I'll tell you guys, we've spent an inordinate amount of time trying to come up with those for how many episodes now, Jeff? Uh, 70 something? Mean 72, I think is our 72nd episode. 72, 72 episodes. No one has once ever commented on it. And I don't need people to comment on it now. But, yeah, don't humor us. Please don't patronize right, us. Right, <laughs> don't like, do it. Like, don't do it. But so what Jeff and I have decided is we're just going to come up with the most ridiculous stuff we can possibly come up with and see if people are like, what are you talking about? <laughs> right. Like, what? Huh? Right, right. So uh, you could tune in and look forward to that stupidity that we have going on now. Um, It'll be fun. We're going to have fun. We'll, we'll still have fun with it, right? Yeah. That'll be good. Yeah. Jeff, I am concerned about the season, though. Why? Well, it, 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 the the pause was me kind of going, I don't, I, want, I don't want to go into this whole as a big conversation. That's why I was trying to, mm. how do I even want to bring it up? I I am growing increasingly worried about the season being over-serialized. Yeah. I, I know what you mean. I think I shared here before, I think, where um, for Starfleet Leadership Academy, 
back when I dropped the 50th episode, oh. I was going to do Picard. Right. And there's no way to do Picard except for the entire season. At you, once. There aren't, yeah, there aren't like the, the individual episodes outside of a handful don't really stand on their own. Uh -huh. And, um, yeah, that I will never do that again. I will never do a whole season again. That took me 39 hours to produce that one hour of audio yeah. for that episode. Um, but yeah, it does make me nervous about this one that we're going to, cause like, I love remembering the episodes and the things and the pieces and the stuff that's going to get really hard where it's just, where all the whole season is just, but dude, people love this season, right? Like that, that was made pretty clear to us from like the middle of the third season on that. Like this is, this is the mountaintop. Uh-huh. Yeah. Maybe we knock it all out in one episode. Maybe we just do the whole season from here out. We just, that's next week. Maybe we do that. Yeah. Yeah. The, the wives would love that. Wouldn't they? Well, so everybody watching, they'd be like, why, why is this episode 16 hours long? <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. All right. Well, I think that's, that's really going to catch it for us here, Jeff, um, with club 65. You guys are awesome. We love you guys. We're going to keep this under 90 minutes today. I know we're going to make it. I do love one of my favorite things through, through the, all 72 episodes of this yeah. are the comments down on YouTube 65. Like I see that. That's and I'm just like yeah. my people, right? You. I, every time I see it, I, people say 65 and it's like a club 65. It's, I don't comment on a lot of comments anymore, Jeff. We we've said this a few times. Like it's, it's yeah. just so much. I do read through them as much as I can. And whenever I see like that one, when I see a 65, I make it a point to stop and say hi. Just for yeah. you guys. So. It, is, it is the best. All right, Jeff, let's get out. Well, of here hey, for let's go watch. Uh, let's go watch some more Babylon 5. Oh, yeah. You want to go see what, what happens to Mr. Garibaldi? I, I do. <laughs> I really do. All right, let's go. See it. Oh, my gosh.